chat is with uh, Tarrant County Commissioner Andy Lamb. And so what I'd like to do is, uh, the purpose of the chamber chat is to try to learn something from your journey, um, where you started and where you are today. So if you could start by telling us where were you born? I was born in Vung Tau, Vietnam. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and tell us about your family. Okay. Um, my family uh, really rooted in the uh, central part of Vietnam, uh, the city of Hue. Those of you who know about Vietnam, the city of Hue was where the, uh, the last uh, emperor of Vietnam resided, where the royal palace was. Uh, my um, great, 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 great daddy uh, converted to uh, Catholicism. Uh, our original last name was V of Vo, that means martial art. Uh, but uh, because of the persecution of Christian, uh, we eventually uh, changed our last name to Win uh, to avoid uh, persecution. Okay, so. Uh, in, in the city of Way, my uh, extended family uh, were, uh, had a, a large presence in the Catholic community there. So uh, my father uh, worked in the, uh, the First Republic of Vietnam uh, when the war broke out and uh, the 1954 Geneva Treaty was signed and Vietnam was broken into two pieces. The Northern belongs to Ho Chi Minh and the Communists and the Chinese and the Soviet Union. And the South uh, belonged to, uh, to uh, the French, uh, the American, and, uh, and a young uh, infant republic led by uh, a gentleman named Ngo Dinh Yim. Uh, in 1963, uh, Ngo Dinh Yim and his brother uh, was, uh, were assassinated. My father was uh, working under that administration. So when that happened, uh, he was uh, sentenced, uh, sentenced to five years in prison uh, in his absence. Okay. Uh, so my father uh, fled to, uh, to South Vietnam into Saigon. Yeah, and he changed his name and he went back to school and learned uh, accounting and finance. Uh, and then he joined the, uh, like a, um, bank president training program and upon graduation he was assigned to uh, a farmer's bank uh, in Vong Tau, uh, Vietnam. His mission was to uh, basically help uh, grow the economy through the fishery and the farming industry in that part uh, of the country. Uh, so when he moved to, uh, to Vong Tau, Vietnam, uh, he was already married and uh, my first two oldest brothers were already born. Uh, and then uh, there in the city of Vung Tau, uh, my parents gave birth to uh, my third brother uh, and then myself and then the rest of my siblings there in the, in the city of Vung Tau. So I was born there uh, in Vung Tau. It's a port city. If you have a phone right now, you can Google Vung Tau, V-U-N-G-T-A-U. Uh, you see it's a beautiful city, a coastal city mountainous on one side and ocean on the other side. It's like Hawaii. It was. It was a favorite uh, vacation spot for American GI there. Um, so I grew up in that area and uh, before the war ended on April 30th, uh, 1975, uh, at the time uh, I grew up almost in a boat uh, because Vung Tau is, uh, was a little bit far away from the war zone because most of the battles were fought up in the high mountainous area in the western part of Vietnam and the, uh, the, the central part of Vietnam. Uh, but um, my, and then my father, he, he really uh, kind of cocooned us and kind of kept uh, the killings and the destruction away from his kids. So uh, I never left um, my house. Uh, we lived on a, a large uh, estate. Um, with a uh, house, with a house built out of uh, cement block uh, by my father. He basically built a house with his own hands and help from, uh, from his friends and so forth. Uh, so um, he, he never really um, exposed us 
to the uh, to the the war, and I only uh, left the house to go to school and go to church. That was about it. So when the war ended uh, on April 30th, 1975, I was in uh, in total shock, as as was many other people, uh, because we we saw. Uh, the, the, um, the terrible scenes of war for the first time. Uh, we saw a platoon and companies of the North Vietnamese Army um, basically uh, invaded uh, some of the compounds in our city. Uh, we saw them uh, arrested people, killing people. Uh, we saw uh, battles uh, on the ground. We saw tanks, we saw helicopters and so forth. Uh, but my father, he, he basically placed us onto a small fishing boat uh, before then, like about 10 days before the war ended, and basically we fled to the ocean. I don't know if you recall back then, uh, at the, uh, the end, during the end of the Vietnam War, uh, there was a, a, a chaotic mass exodus. Uh, the United States really didn't want to uh, let the Vietnamese, the South Vietnamese, leave because it was a quiet and silent operation. Uh, remember, they played uh, that, uh, I believe that Christmas song, uh, the white something, white Christmas, mm -hmm. and that was a secret code for the American working in Saigon at the time to know that, hey, it's time for y'all to leave. That was, the, that was a code. Well, somehow there were uh, two or three Americans who I believe had conscience and they overcame uh, their sense of uh, obedience and they uh, notified some of their closest friends. And that was how words got out. Those gentlemen later on was court martialed. But because of that, they saved about 250,000 South Vietnamese. We got out uh, during that, uh, that time. We still deem those people to be our heroes. Um, unfortunately, my family didn't make it. We, we tried, uh, but one thing led to another. The owner of the boat, uh, she didn't want to leave. Even though we were already in the international water, we saw the American naval fleet were waiting out there for us. But he, uh, she didn't want to leave. She didn't want to go. She decided to turn back. So we turned back to uh, Vung Tau and uh, we basically landed and uh, we came back to, uh, to the house. And uh, I remember walking over dead bodies, uh, ammunitions, 50 cal ammunition was everywhere. Uh, M60s, uh, M16s, uh, abandoned weapons were everywhere, literally. Uh, so when I came home, there was a platoon of uh, Vietnamese, North Vietnamese communists there. They uh, basically uh, took over the house <coughs> and they were cooking. Uh, uh, they, they built a fire in the middle of the living room they were cooking, even though we had a kitchen in the back. Uh, these people, they lived in the jungle for so long. So long, so they, they, they were not familiar with the amenities um, <clears throat> in city life. So they um, kicked us out. Uh, but after uh, multiple negotiation by my father, they uh, basically allowed us to stay in a small part of the house. Uh, so that was the beginning, I guess, of my journey. And I was eight years old. I was eight years old. Um, <laughs> What did that, <clears throat> before you move on from that, what did that, what, I guess what feeling or how did that impact you? What do you carry with you today from that? I remember a too vivid image. I don't know why I remember this, but uh, it just so. <laughs> I'm sure my siblings have other images, but two, two images stuck with me. The first one was when we were prepared to leave Vietnam uh, before the end of the war. My mother uh, had a um, tailor sew some, a nice, really nice shirt for, for each of her child, each of her children. Uh, I remember the color. It was um, kind of burgundy, uh, striped, green, and so forth. I remember that vividly. Mm -hmm. And it was like Christmas. You know, we, we didn't know uh, what was happening, but my mother was preparing uh, for us uh, to, uh, to leave Vietnam and if we 
uh, end up ended up in another country or something, uh, at least we would wear that nice new shirt, mm -hmm. okay, uh, in our new land or new home, wherever we were headed. Uh, the second uh, image that I remember was when, um, before my father was arrested, mm -hmm. I remember it was a very dark night, and my father was sitting in a, um, uh, almost a bench, but not a, a, a swing. That's a, a bench, but it looked like a swing, but it's a bench. And that's the best way I can describe it. Um, it was handmade by my father, and uh, I remember he sat in the middle, and uh, my siblings were basically sitting next to him and so forth, and we were swinging back and forth. And I, we looked out uh, on the street through, uh, we had a wall built out of a cement block, and it had some gaps. I could remember seeing through the gaps, and there were flashlights of police cars running and then stopping in front of one resident, one residence, and then uh, they would come in and pull a man out and put him in, in, that, in the car. And they would move on to the next one, you know. And I was thinking vividly, I was like, uh, I told my dad, Dad, how come we, we don't move to Hanoi? There's no war there. Mm -hmm. Hanoi is the, is the, was the capital, is the capital of North Vietnam at the time. And I was eight years old, I didn't know. And my father, uh, said uh, it's too late for us to do that now. It was, it's too late for us to do that now. So I remember that image. Um, so I, I didn't really understand what was going on, but I sensed something drastic, something uh, terrible mm -hmm. uh, was about to happen to my family. And sure enough, the, uh, the very next, uh, that, that evening, uh, well, I meant that morning, because it was about 8, 9 p.m. when we sat in front of our, uh, our home and uh, about 2 or 3 a.m. they came. They busted down the front door and uh, they uh, arrested my father. I remember my father was, uh, he was, he knew it was gonna happen. He was very calm, he was very calm. Uh, he uh, had a, uh, a, sh a short sleeve dress shirt on uh, it wasn't tucked in. Um, he had a, a pair of gray trousers and with sandals. And uh, they basically um, came in and forced him against the wall, made him sit down. And uh, they had two soldiers uh, in full battle gear, uh, locked and loaded with AK-47 pointed at his face and his hat. And uh, they wanted to, um, they asked for gold and for money and so forth. And uh, they took um, myself and my siblings all the way to the back, and they were inquiring about uh, uh, the location of gold and money. And my father told them, gold and money, yes, but they're at the vault in the bank. They're not here. And they, somehow they believed that my father had a lot to do with financing the war, basically. Okay. Uh, so that was the crime that they charged him with, without trial. Okay, they arrested him for the crime of financing the war against the people of Vietnam. So they took him away. They took him away for about um, three years. At the time, my youngest brother, Lou, he lives in Granbury now. He was uh, just born at home. He was born at home because of the war. We couldn't go to the hospital. So he was born at home, and she... She was in bed with my, uh, my, uh, my youngest brother and the police came and they made her uh, get out of her room and they searched the house all over. They turned everything upside down. And I remember there was a Samson night, a briefcase, and we, it was filled with pictures of the family, family pictures. And uh, the soldier took it and my father begged, we begged him to leave it. He said, you know, you can have the Samson night, you can have it, just leave the pictures. They said no. And so that's why today I don't have any picture of, uh, of where I, of our younger years. The only picture I have was uh, when I visited my cousin in San Antonio who just immigrated from, uh, from Vietnam over and she brought one uh, 
picture with her of uh, myself and my older brother and two other siblings. And that picture was taken when I was about five years old, when I was about five or six years old in, in, in our house. So uh, they took my father away uh, in, uh, into what they call the re-education camp, but really it was a, a hard labor camp. It was a hard labor camp. Um, so um, the, uh, the communists took, uh, basically um, kicked us out of our house and, and then through multiple uh, negotiation, uh, my mother was able to uh, let them to stay in about a quarter of our house. Uh, and they utilized the rest of the house as a police compound. Uh, as a police compound, but we had to pay rent. We had to pay rent. And um, so we lived there, and uh, my mother was a homemaker. Mm -hmm. She didn't have any skill. Uh, and uh, my, uh, my oldest brother was, uh, I believe at the time, 16 years old, 16 or 17 years old at most. And I was, uh, I was uh, eight years old, and I, was, I am the fourth in my family. And I have, uh, at the time, I have uh, a total of seven other siblings. Okay, so a total eight of us. Wow. And the oldest brother uh, was 16 years old and the youngest was barely a month old. Okay, so well, we had nothing to eat. There was, so my mother um, literally went door to door begging for food and so forth. Initially, you know, people were generous because the, uh, you know, they still had some food supply left over during the good years under uh, democracy and freedom. But eventually they ran out of, of, of food and they had to save food for their own family. So uh, it was, we went on um, and suffering from starvation for months. So there I learned at the age of eight, nine, ten years old, I learned how to fish, I learned how to hunt, I learned how to live off the land. We, we ate uh, vegetation, uh, we learned how to distinguish between poisonous uh, and non-poisonous stuff. We learned how to uh, catch uh, gizzard. Uh, we would take a little stick, kind of like a bamboo, and we would uh, uh, get a, uh, a can, like a tin can, um, you know, and oh, then we... Like a trap. Right, right. Uh, basically, yes. Lizards, yeah. And we would sit on the cement and we would take the can and keep um, moving back and forth on, on the cement until the, the bottom fell off. When the bottom fell off, and then we would uh, utilize uh, tools to cut them and then tie them to one end of it so it would be like this, right? And we would have a little string, pull it down, and then build uh, a knot around it, like a, a loose around it. And the, the gecko, um, the lizard would come up from from, from Earth through his uh, little hole and he would uh, stick to it and the, uh, the trap would catch. Uh, that was how, one example of how we survived. Uh, we, uh, we caught those uh, lizards and they kept us alive for a long time. There were a lot of lizards. <laughs> and uh, eventually uh, we ate them all. We ate them all. Uh, we had a little river in the back. We ate all the fish in the river and then we eventually migrated to the ocean and we kept moving out and, and we were not the only family that was in starvation so the whole town was okay so as you can imagine we salvaged the land we basically uh, completely exhausted the natural resources there in that area we learned how to uh, to uh, chop wood uh, there was a little uh, a small island uh, off the coast of where I live and um, myself and several uh, village boys would, would uh, swim across the channel. I would say at least a mile or so. Mm -hmm. We would swim across. Uh, when we were tired, then we would flip around and kind of float. And then until we uh, got better, and then we would continue on swimming. Okay. And then when you got to the island, the reason, because it was a remote island and nobody really lived there, uh, so it had a lot of uh, food, mm -hmm. 
-hmm. Okay, uh, vegetation, woods, uh, we would chop down uh, the woods and then we would tie them up and then pull them across the channel because uh, the wood was so heavy it would uh, sink to the bottom so we would follow it okay and then take a deep breath follow it and then pull it along the, the bottom okay until we run ran out of breath and then we would uh, rise to the surface catch another breath and then dove back down and that was how we got the wood across the channel uh, and then when we got there and then we would basically drag them home spread them out on the field, let them dry, cut them up, and form them into a one meter square. One meter up, one meter uh, long. And that was how we, we sell wood. Uh, you buy them by the meter. <laughs> uh, basically, that's what we learned how to survive. We did to learn how to survive. And in 1978, my father came home. He was released. He was released, he came home, and uh, he learned uh, about how we survived uh, and so forth. And uh, he, he basically was very determined to get out, to, to leave. He knew that there wasn't any uh, future for us. At the time, the communists of Vietnam decided to attack uh, Laos and Cambodia, and they wanted to colonize those two countries as well. And so young men uh, were being drafted to go fight in, in Laos and Cambodia. And so my father uh, was determined to find a way to get out. Uh, so uh, at the time, uh, people, they, they, they said that even if a light pole had legs, they would have left. Okay. So everybody was uh, leaving. The, the goal and the dream was America. So you wake up one morning and suddenly that house next door to you was empty. And people would be screaming, oh, the dough, the, 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 the wind, the winds have gone to America, the winds have gone to America. And people would rush in and they would try to salvage whatever uh, is left in that house. Okay? And that happens on a daily occurrence. So it was a dream. It was a dream for everybody to go to America. Literally, they never said go to France or go to England, go to Germany, go to Russia, go to none of that. The goal was to go to America go to America. In Vietnamese, the me, me, okay. The word me means America, but literal meaning, it means beautiful. <coughs> me means beautiful, okay. Uh, so, uh, the, the, the Vietnamese name for America is beautiful, okay. So we would say go to America, but really we would say go to the beautiful land, okay. So uh, that happens on a daily uh, basis regularly. Um, so when my father came home, he decided that, uh, that we're going to fight our ways out. So he learned how to uh, navigate. He learned about astronomy. He had friends that used to work for the, uh, the, the weather forecasting agency back in the good old days. So he met with them secretly and they would teach him how to read, how to forecast weather, how, what to see in the sky and so forth to predict. Uh, the rising tide, uh, or uh, a tornado, or a hurricane, and so forth. So he learned to navigate. At the same time, he would connect with those who uh, want to escape, and they would basically utilize gold. At that time, the currency was gold, okay? <laughs> uh, because the communists are uh, very cunning. They, uh, the first thing they did was they have a currency exchange. So 500 dong of the South Vietnamese money would be the equivalent of one dump of the new communist currency. So you were a wealthy family, guess what? Mm -hmm. By the time they're done, they did that three times in a matter of one year, in 1975. From April 1975 until December 1975, they did that three times. So everybody, and that's how the communists control you, okay? They basically, they, in Vietnamese we call it, they call it, they, they grab you by the stomach, okay? They grab you by the stomach, and if you resist, they squeeze it completely. They cut you off, and you become starved. Maybe you can handle it, but what about your kids? What about your family? So you have to comply. So you have to comply. And after a while, they let it go a little bit. They kind of they put a 
choke on you, right? You couldn't breathe. After a while, you were accustomed to it. You see? And then they let go a little bit. They said, oh, great. You are such a nice person. Thank you. You're a great government, right? But really, they still have a choke in your throat. They only let go of your airway a little bit. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And that's the way the communists oppress uh, its people. And uh, so in 1978, my father made a plan uh, to escape. I remember the escape. Now, before that, multiple times. But every, every failed attempt, we were able to, uh, to safely return home. But that one final attempt in 1975, it did not pan out. Uh, so my father was arrested. Uh, my mother was arrested. I was arrested. Everybody was arrested. Okay. And they took us in. Uh, I was tortured a little bit. Got you know, a couple smacked up the side of my head uh, for uh, not uh, basically revealing what the secrets of my father held. I didn't know what he would. He protected us by not sharing anything with us. And um, so they basically took my father in to back to prison, and we went back to our uh, measles um, livelihood at the time. So my father, um, in 1979, uh, like I said, people were planning escapes all over, and because we lived in a coastal town, uh, we learned to spot when uh, people from the urban area would come and, uh, and try to sneak out on a boat. We learned. We saw the signs. Okay? So uh, young men and women and even children in, in our village, uh, we, we, uh, we recognized the signs and we would uh, basically hide in uh, different spots. And then when the, um, at night, when the urban people come, we would uh, try to mingle in with them. That's what my first two brothers did. We call that kan mai. That means uh, you get to uh, join the the escape without having to pay. Okay, it's been kan mai. Um, a lot of people did that. Uh, some successfully, some not so su successfully. Uh, but luckily, my first two brothers uh, did that. And what happened was there was an attempt to escape. Uh, it fell. Uh, the police went after them. They were shooting at people. And then the owner of the boat knew that uh, he would be executed. So he took a chance. He ran around the village and announced that those who want to escape, now is your opportunity. Bring your water, bring whatever uh, diesel you have, and let's go. So everybody was rushing uh, out to the coast, to the, uh, the port, to the pier. And uh, my uh, oldest brother uh, ran home and uh, woke up my second oldest brother. Uh, my oldest brother now lives in Grand Prairie. My second oldest brother now is a Catholic pastor of uh, our Holy Family in Fort Worth. And, uh, they, and then my third brother woke up and uh, my third brother opened the door, uh, let my first two brothers out. He locked the door and we went back to bed. We still laughed about that. <laughs> we still, we, how come he didn't leave? But in a way, it was, uh, uh, we were happy that he didn't leave because he had asthma. Uh, he would have died uh, in that journey. But it took, um, they basically, my first two brothers finally got on the boat and then uh, the police were going after them. It's a small fishing boat, okay? So they turned it. And by the time they got to the international water, uh, the boat was rendered uh, inoperable. And uh, so they floated on the ocean for 30 days. Wow. No food, no water. Well, nobody brought food. <laughs> everybody, uh. Uh, everybody was too busy We're running to, for freedom. So nobody brought food uh, except what, whatever was left on the boat. Uh, the owner of the boat decided to monopolize the food for himself and his family. He had an M16 fully loaded so nobody um, uh, basically dared to uh, uh, to attack his family because he uh, he had a weapon so people it was like I believe it was 59 or 61 people on that boat only one person died uh, they learned how to fish 
Uh, it's a long story. I can tell you the story for, it would take a book about well, how three did you get things. out? How did you, what happened, what was the story there? Well, my, relatively, it? comparing to my older brothers, it was relatively simple. Mm -hmm. uh, it was relatively simple, but anyway, so when my father, when my first two brothers were escaped, they were saved by the, uh, the naval fleet, the U.S. Mm -hmm. naval fleet in the Philippines. And they were brought to a refugee camp in Thailand and because they were saved by the American. Um, they were by, placed on an airplane and flown to, uh, to, to the United States. Mm -hmm. They settled in uh, Covington, Kentucky, because some of my uh, father's older friends back in the banking days, back in Vietnam, they, in 1975, when they got out, they settled in Covington, Kentucky. And uh, the Catholic Church there, Holy Cross Catholic Church, also sponsored us. Mm -hmm. okay. And that was how um, uh, my first two brothers ended up in Covington, Kentucky. Mm -hmm. okay. um, so they would send back uh, stuff, mm -hmm. merchandise to Vietnam, and we would sell it and survive. Mm -hmm. And that was um, basically our heydays after the war. Mm -hmm. uh, we would wait for a box, a shipment of merchandise from my brother and we would sell it and then the communists would come in and they would confis confiscate what they wanted and then they would leave the stuff and uh, I remember I could show you the wound on my left chin here I was uh, gathering woods and one of those uh, pointy wood stuck into my shin and eventually became infected there wasn't any medicine doctor uh, or hospital or anything like that even if there was we couldn't afford it so uh, I, I, uh, I found one of the, uh, this bottle of cream that my, my, my brother sent home, so I kept using it. I keep uh, putting that cream on, my, uh, on the wound. And eventually it got infected really bad and I couldn't even walk. I was crawling. I was hopping around on one leg. And finally I came out to, uh, to, uh, to a dam next to the house. It was uh, salt water and that was how I infected the wound, using salt water. And eventually we, uh, it, it, it healed, okay. But later on, when we came to America, when I saw that tube again in the store, and I realized I was using band gay. Oh, oh, no. oh, no. oh my! So uh, uh, that story tells you uh, a little bit about our ignorance, mm -hmm. about the the bigger society mm -hmm. out there. It tells you about our desperation, mm -hmm. okay. Anything from America was great. It doesn't matter what. Yeah. Uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't matter what, okay? as long as it has the word made in USA, that gave us hope. Yeah. Okay? It doesn't matter what. Okay? Now, if it's made in China, uh, you got to be careful. That could be artificial stuff. It could be fake. Okay? But if it's made in USA, nobody asks any questions. In fact, they will pay premium for stuff made in USA. Uh, so, so you got to America. I got there. Basically, uh, in 1981, when my father was released, he planned another escape. He planned another escape similarly uh, the way he did in 1978. Uh, to make a long story short, uh, we got on the boat. This time my father, due to his experience, he, he learned how to uh, walk around the communist police. And the good way to walk around them uh, was to bribe everybody. Okay, uh, the mistake that he made in 1978 was he bribed the police, but he did not bribe the soldiers. Okay, so the soldier went after us in 1978. So in 1981, he decided he going to bribe every law enforcement uh, agency in town. So it was a policeman, it was a local uh, guard, uh, it was the, uh, the soldiers, four or five, he, he basically bribed them all. Okay. And that, we, and when that happened, they turned a blind eye and we left. Uh, it took 10 days. It took 10 days and uh, we got to the coast of Malaysia. They called the city called Thranganu in Malaysia. And uh, it was Palm Sunday, 1981. It was Palm Sunday, 1981. Uh, we were transported by the Malaysian police to the refugee camp called Pulau Bidong. It's a, um, it was an island off the coast of Malaysia. Uh, we stayed there. That camp was infested with rats. I had never seen rats so big. It's about this size. 
Yes, huge. And they lived under uh, the ground. They lived under the ground, and we would build our beds um, out of uh, coconut uh, leaves. Uh, there were a lot of coconut trees, a lot of coconut trees on that uh, on that island. And um, I remember one time, for what reason or another, the United Nations decided. Oh, I remember now the head of the camp. It was a Malaysian. He were uh, basically abusing the, the refugees. He was abusing the fellow refugees, and some of the men had him. Okay, so they decided to trap him one day and beat the heck out of him. Okay, and they did that. And so the head of the refugee camp decided to um, to respond, and the way uh, his response was to cut off food supply for the whole camp. So we ran out of food. And guess what we ate? Rats. Rats. Mm. Right. Chicken. Yes. It tastes like chicken. chicken. <laughs> <laughs> yes. But anyway, uh, we learned English. Uh, our lives there was relatively simple. Uh, it was it was like heaven. Mm -hmm. I don't remember recall worrying about anything. Uh, it was by the ocean. So we'd wake up early in the morning. We would climb on top of the mountain. There was this cliff. You stand on that cliff, you look down, so it must have been like 50 feet high. You could see the very bottom of the ocean. It was that crystal clear. And we would dove, the kids, we would dove head down. And we would basically swim all day long and then uh, get back and catch some fish and just grill them on open fire. And that was all I for six months. Learning English, go to church, and and then uh, we were transferred to another camp in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia, uh, to learn more English. And then uh, we were sponsored by my first two brothers mm -hmm. and the Holy Cross Catholic Church. And uh, we were placed on an airplane. Uh, we were flown to Los Angeles. And we landed in Los Angeles on August 26, 1981. So I was born in, on August 15th. 1966, and so I tell people that I was born twice, mm -hmm. both in the month of August, mm -hmm. and that's why I'm a very, very strong Leo. Yes. Uh, so that's basically uh, August 26 uh, was the beginning of my American journey. Mm -hmm. Okay, but it took that much effort to get here. Uh, to get here, and it was worth it. It was really. So worth when it. you landed there, what? What, how did you get from there to here today? Uh, there was an agency. Uh, it's part of the United Nations. It's called the uh, United Nations Higher Commission for Refugees. Okay. As you know, the United States uh, financed probably 60% of the United Nations budget. So a lot of the support there came from the United States. Uh, we had people. Uh, from the United Nations, but really they worked for the American Embassy. They would meet us there and they would lead us uh, to spots. I remember uh, when we saw the escalator, I didn't know how to work it. We was like standing up there looking at this thing keep rolling to the top and people. So we would like try to catch it, you know. Uh, so we didn't know anything. We had on uh, used clothing given to us. We had one little plastic bag, and that was all we had. So we f were flown to uh, to Cincinnati uh, Airport, and my uh, my brothers picked up there. And that was all our uh, reunion. That was all reunion. Uh, there we was. I was sent to um, uh, Holmes High School, Covington Holmes High School, um, enrolled in eighth grade uh, during my first year. I failed every classes, every one of them, every one of them, English, history, biology, whatever. It was, it was uh, a total failure, it was an F, because I couldn't speak English. I was learning English, but when it came to math, uh, we were number one. <laughs> <laughs> That's the international language, yeah. right, mathematics. So, I mean, uh, we... Mm -hmm. When it came to uh, math classes, I remember Mr. Broom, who would let all the Vietnamese students, myself, two other, and my brother, uh, 
sit in the back and we would play cards and he would leave us alone and once in a while my older brother who's really smart at math he's a, he has a master degree now in thermodynamics as a mechanical engineer he's working for Texas Instrument now uh, but he would turn around he said Mr. Broom that's not right yeah. and Mr. Broom said what yeah look at that and he started explaining himself oh Mr. Broom said oh thank you here thank you so he and then he would make so when it comes to mathematics, uh, our level of education was, I, I believe, was like three levels higher than uh, the other American students at the time. We were picked on naturally. Uh, people make fun of us. You know, they, they would mimic how we speak English. And they would uh, pull our shorts down. And they would uh, make fun of you. Uh, you know, we went through all that stuff. But, at one time, I remember Doug Jones, a very big football player. Uh, he would always wipe uh, this wet towel at me after gym during the locker room. And just something in me snapped. One day I had enough. So I pulled out because this, this belt that we bought from, uh, from Goodwill, it has this huge bull head <laughs> in it. Okay? And of course, I was made fun because of that belt. So I utilized that belt and I whipped the heck out of Doug Jones. <laughs> and then he chased me and his football players chased me across the football field, across the gym, outside the football field. I uh, jumped over a fence and landed on Green Up Street. I landed on Green Up Street. They jumped the fence and they caught me uh, and I was ready to defend uh, for my life. Luckily, two other fellow Vietnamese refugees lived nearby. Mm -hmm. And they came out, and the three of us fought about six big football players. And we whipped the heck out of them. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't know how to fight. <laughs> you mean? One, one advantage of growing up in Vietnam is you learn how to fight. Yeah. And the good way to attack a tall guy is to attack his feet. <laughs> and we did that. We've got about 10 minutes, yes. and I want to see if anybody wants to ask a specific question. So, Annika, I'm sorry. It's a long story. No, 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 I mean, no, 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 it would take a, a week story. or two to tell you all the bits and pieces. Uh, but uh, to, to, make the, the, to sum it up, um, the, the mistake that we made uh, during the Vietnam War, uh, when I say we, I'm talking about the United States government at the time caused uh, a tremendous uh, suffering for the people of South Vietnam and the entire country of South Vietnam. Today, even today, after 42 years, after 42 years, uh, Vietnam is still suffering under the rule of, of that oppressive uh, government. Okay. Uh, and the, the decisions that were made, although controversial, right now, but in hindsight, there were great lessons. There were great lessons learned from it. Uh, we didn't lose the, to the Viet Cong in the battlefield. We did not lose to them uh, because of, of uh, the, uh, the moral of the war. I believe the war was just. We simply lost to them on the propaganda front, on the political front. So we lost the Vietnam War really in Washington, D.C and in the college campuses of, uh, of America. And the South Vietnamese government at that time, some of them uh, were uh, good leaders, but most of them were corrupt. But if you look at the 5,000 years of history of Vietnam, think about it. Uh, we were colonized by the French at the time, 400 years. Before that, uh, we were um, basically dominated by the Chinese, controlled by the Chinese, 4,000 years. And that, that seed of democracy that, in, uh, that America planted in uh, that part of Vietnam, in South Vietnam, it was growing. But it was, it was from 1959 until 1963. I mean, how fast do you want the democracy to grow? It, three years. It was three years. But we lost patience and we decided to participate in a coup that basically killed the only legitimate uh, elected leader of South Vietnam, 
at the time President Modi did. And to this day, we still justify that mistake by basically telling bad stories about that president. Okay, and I don't think it's fair. I don't think it's right. We made a mistake. Over to it. We basically the CIA conducted the coup and killed the president and his brother, and that was a huge mistake. Whether we agree with him, them or not, at the time, they were trying to manage a three-year-old democracy. Okay, from a country that had. 5,000 years of monarchy dominated and controlled by the Chinese and eventually by the French, colonized by the French. Okay. People, 99% of the population was uneducated. Okay. So that was a big mistake and I carry that burden with me every day. Uh, I remember that mistake. Uh, I remember uh, what uh, some of the uh, American leaders at the time said in 1975 when they say we will not have uh, the books in, in this land. I remember Governor Jerry Brown of, uh, of California and when the first C-130 landed in California he came out to the runway and tried to prevent it from landing. Uh, I remember those. Okay. So um, the lessons learned from the Vietnam War I, uh, I bury it deep in my heart and in my memory, and that's why I, uh, I decided to, to run for public office, because uh, I, I firmly believe that, that a, a, a doctor can make a mistake, the doctor can kill one life or two, uh, an attorney made a mistake, it can destroy one family or two, but if a politician makes a mistake, it can destroy generations of people for years and decades and centuries. And that's the mistake that some American politicians made during the Vietnam War. Have caused 90 millions of Vietnamese living under communism. And Vietnam right now is at the highest risk level ever of becoming a province of China. Okay. That mistake, the Vietnamese people are still paying for it. So that's why I decided to run for public office, to make sure, to do my part, in making sure that the policy made at the governmental level uh, is the right one, is the right one. So I'll shut up and let you all ask questions. Any questions? Yeah, I have a question. Oh. Hey. Forgive me, Commissioner, this may reveal a lot of ignorance on my part, but since you escaped Vietnam, uh, are you able to travel back there? Have you been back since you... Uh, um, like, China, like China, like Russia? No, uh, in, in the Vietnam itself. Right. Vietnam decided that uh, they're going to open up, they basically they will allow an open uh, mm -hmm. uh, enterprise, okay, so they can salvage their economy. Uh, so now people can travel back to Vietnam as long as they stay out of politics um, and just focus on business or uh, touring the country, that would be fine. So if I wanted to right now, I would uh, be able to go back, uh, but I don't want to. Uh, I don't want to go back to a land uh, that I ran away from because the oppressors are still there. In my opinion, by going back and visit, in some way I would validate their leadership their, um, of, of Vietnam and I, I don't want to do that. So yes, people can come back now, uh, but uh, I haven't. And I continue uh, to uh, do what I can to fight that government. Uh, and I think they have blacklisted me. If I apply for a visa, they probably would deny it. They probably would deny it because constantly I would work with the United States Congress to pass legislation uh, that would, uh, like we have the uh, Senator Cornyn sponsor a piece of legislation named the Vietnam Human Rights Sanction Act. Okay. That means the human rights abusers in Vietnam, they would be sanctioned. They would not be able to transfer their dirty money to Vietnam, I mean to, uh, to bank accounts outside of Vietnam, they cannot obtain visa, traveling to the United States, 
their friends, I mean their relatives cannot uh, go to colleges in the United States. So that legislation is, is on the floor now and I'm pushing for it. So as a result, that I may not be granted a visa, but I have not asked. So, yes sir. Do you have any family still over there? Uh, not immediate family. Not immediate family. Still have uncles and aunts and so forth there, but I, all of my immediate family members are here now. My mother and my youngest brother stay behind uh, and to basically be the cover uh, for us when we escaped in 1981. They uh, eventually, when we got here, when we became United States citizens, uh, we sponsored uh, my mother and my youngest brother. It took us uh, 10 years uh, for the United States government to accept them as a legal immigrant. And they were flown here to the United States at our expense, uh, and we were reunited in 1991. In 1991, so it took uh, my family the journey of 1975 to 1991 to be fully reunited as one family. Are your parents still alive? My parents are still alive. They live here in Fort Worth. Wow. They live here. They live in Fort Worth. I live in Arlington. Uh, few brothers live in Grand Prairie. Uh, my other brother and sister live in uh, Arlington and then uh, as I mentioned my second oldest brother is a, um, a pastor of uh, Holy Family Catholic Church in Fort Worth and then my sixth brother is pastor of St. Peter and John in Georgetown, Kentucky. Yes. As I recall, you uh, later served as an officer in the U.S. Army? Yes, I uh, was that experience. Uh, I always wanted to be a soldier. Uh, I was uh, idealistic in the sense that I wanted to join the army and in case there was an opportunity I would volunteer to go back to Vietnam <laughs> because uh, there was a huge sentiment at the time in 1980s. Uh, the Vietnamese community here, uh, the, the first generation of the Vietnamese community immigrants, they didn't think they would stay here. They didn't think so. Their goal has always been to go back and regain the homeland. Uh, so there was a huge uh, movement back then uh, to basically uh, create armed forces to, uh, to go back and, and fight the communists back then. And uh, I was a young kid and I was gung-ho and I hated the communists. I want to basically uh, do my part. And, uh, and I heard about, at that time, you know, uh, President Reagan and, and, um, and other presidents after him were dealing with the, uh, the Russian issue, uh, the Soviet Union, I'm sorry. And uh, I, I had this black spot in my heart for communists, okay. And I volunteered. I wanted to join the Army. I want to do what I can. So I volunteered as an ROTC cadet, uh, so I was commissioned as an officer, uh, but during my training years, I didn't get paid. You're supposed to get $100 per month. Uh, but because I was a, a United States citizen, I was a legal resident, so uh, they couldn't pay me. They couldn't pay me. So the colonel told me that. I said, no problem. I do it for free. <laughs> so I went through the whole training, and upon graduation, that's what I love about the United States government, because the communist government would never do that. They gave me a back pay, a big old check. I remember it was like four or five thousand dollars. I mean, for a young college graduate, that was a lot of money, interest and all. Mm -hmm. And I looked at it and I said, wow. <laughs> I was thinking, the communist government would never do this. Okay. Uh, but uh, I got a big check. So uh, the moment that I was, I couldn't graduate with my class. Mm -hmm. So Colonel Lemon held me over and he commissioned me in his office. With my father and my brothers there in his office. So when, I, when he pinned that butter ball, the lieutenant ball, on my uh, uniform, that was the, one of the proudest moments of my life. That was one of the proudest moments of my life. Do. I'm going to stop you. <laughs> uh, it is 9 o'clock, so for those of you, uh, just to be respectful of everybody's time, if you need to leave, please go ahead. If you want to stay and continue to visit, feel free. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for your presence.